Thanks, everyone. Uh, Al, you're a pretty tough act to follow. Uh, I'm actually pretty curious what happened to that uh, magazine lady that, that... Oh, she got fired. Oh, okay. I, 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 was, I was wondering if you, uh, if you hired her. Um, but anyway, I, I'm Vlad. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Webflow. Uh, most importantly, I'm a dad. That's sort of my, my thing. Um, I frustrate a lot of people by making uh, a lot of bad jokes, which I'll spare you from, because last time people got hurt. Um, uh, but I, I will give you one qualifier, though. Does anyone know what uh, differentiates a regular joke from a dad joke? So with a di Ah, that's what my daughter says. Uh, but with a dad joke, the punchline is apparent. Uh, anywho, um, since break is coming up a lot faster, we're going to have to uh, blast through this. Um, uh, so we're going to go fast, kind of like time flies fast. That's, that's my daughter seven years ago, um, which uh, enjoy your time with your loved ones. It goes by uh, way too fast. Uh, so today I actually wanted to talk about um, Al, I love your, your focus on kind of owning your story, owning your, your business, not giving uh, away control. That was my original intention. Uh, th those are the, like the ideals that I had, and, and I just wanted to tell you the story of how, what actually happened, how, uh, how my story kind of deviated from that, and how Webflow stumbled into being what a lot of people consider a bootstrap company, um, but that's not actually true. Um, and how we got uh, to uh, something that is now profitable, um, but there's a lot more nuance to that. Uh, so Webflow actually, I try to start it four different times. Uh, the first time it was with uh, this random guy that I did web design projects with. Uh, another time, a year later, it was with my college professor. Uh, then I got a full-time job, and uh, it was a, with a couple buddies uh, that I worked at, at Intuit. Um, and this last time, hopefully final time, um, it was uh, with my brother, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. Um, so some lessons there uh, is if you want a successful company, which I think Webflow <laughs> is, uh, just uh, shut it down a couple times and, and uh, start again. Uh, and make sure to like, mix up your co-founders because you kind of have to you know, try them out. And you end up with your siblings anyway because uh, those are the people you, uh, you trust. So this is my sibling. This is Sergi. Uh, he's... Uh, Hanging out with llamas, because uh, that makes sense. Um, and in 2012, uh, we kind of had a, um, a text chain going back and forth around like me trying to convince him to, to work on Webflow. Uh, and I think I was pitching him like, hey, come work for me um, and, and do these designs for uh, $4,000 or whatever. But the interesting thing is here, um, I said like, equities for suckers. Like, you, you need like real, real cash. So I'll pay you um, cold hard cash. Uh, so that's kind of how I uh, convinced them to do it. And we wanted to create a real business. We wanted to do exactly what Al was doing, like, you know, real revenues, real customers, uh, none of this, like, VC business, uh, no, no, like, you know, buying growth for the sake of growth, et cetera. Uh, we just wanted to build a really amazing product that solved our own problem. Uh, and we were like, yeah, of course, everyone's going to pay us. Uh, easy peasy, right? And uh, this whole thing is just going to take us a couple months. Um, and the, a, a little detail there is that I had two kids and I was married, um, I was going to say at the time, but I'm still, I still have two kids and I'm still married. Uh, but that was, uh, an idea that was enticing to me, but not necessarily, uh, to my wife. My kids had no choice. Uh, so I had to convince her to put in two months, um, to try to get something off the ground. And of course, in two months, I'm going to replace my salary. I think I was you know, making just a little over $100,000 at Intuit. It's like, of course, in two months, we're going to build this product, and people are going to come, and uh, we'll have our salary back. So I put in my notice, convinced my wife, and uh, this is kind of where we stood. Like, we had $5,000 in the bank, um, and you know, the company had no money. It wasn't even a company anymore, uh, a company yet. Uh, but I was lucky enough that Intuit had um, stock options that I got over the seven years that I worked there. Uh, so I cashed those out, and I got another $40,000 um, after taxes, which I think if I stayed there, uh, Intuit stock was at $20 when I left. Uh, had I stayed there, it would have been worth like $4 million because it went to $160,000. So... Um, <clears throat> 
maybe there's an alternate uh, universe where I would have been telling a different story. Um, but anyway, immediately transferred $20,000 $20, to the company because, of course, that uh, should, should pay for everything. You know, uh, we're going to turn $20,000 into at least $200,000 in revenue, and uh, uh, off we go. So it's, uh, it's time to do real work. So what is the first thing that we do? Uh, of course, we need to get brand new laptops. Um, you know, like super uh, cutting edge. We had laptops, by the way. Uh, we just needed the, the new ones uh, because that's what, you know, real businesses do, right? And it's deductible, so it's basically free, right? So. Uh, um, so we, we start working, we, our home, our office was my kitchen table, uh, which was uh, not annoying at all to my wife and kids. Um, and, uh, you know, those laptops cost a pretty penny. Uh, we, we were kind of, and then we had like professional headshots done, of course. <laughs> uh, and we got off to the races creating not the product, but the designs to put up on Dribbble to get designers excited uh, about the product that we were going to build. Um, and before you know it, um, you know, we sort of like felt like a real thing was happening. So we, uh, we thought, all right, we have to incorporate. So then we went to a lawyer and they charged 5,000 bucks and uh, all right, now we're uh, at half of our original investment. And of course, it takes money to operate the family. We have to pay rent, there's a car payment, there's uh, kids are going to school, you have to pay for food. And, uh, you know, the, the family bank account is going down. By the way, we're fully cashed out of all of our uh, assets. Uh, and then another month goes by and boom, like the, the bank account keeps going down. So we're kind of in trouble, right? Like there's no product yet. We're, n we're not even, we have some dribble shots. Uh, so, and, and some laptops I think we can resell. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go on Kickstarter. That's a new thing. Um, so, of course, like Kickstarter, that's a no-brainer, right? Like, we'll create an amazing video, we'll, uh, everybody will see it and be like super excited, we'll give us money, we'll make like 300K and then like off to the races, we'll make salaries. Um, so, of course, we start making a video, that's what designers do, they put a bunch of postcards on, uh, on a wall and you make a story, we start watching all these like Steve Jobs uh, keynotes to get inspired, you know, to like really uh, make sure our story resonates with the audience. Uh, we, we rent out this super swanky Airbnb because you need that like sweet bouquet in the background with like, you know, just so it looks professional. We hire this like really pro Kickstarter um, uh, consultant that, that knows how to, you know, create rewards and make, make these uh, super awesome videos. Uh, we make the, like this time lapse thing, and we even have a little keyboard cat thing, which uh, which is gonna blow up the internet. Okay, like this was a good idea, um, and I'm glad it was Sergi and not me uh, doing that, or at least that's the part that's documented. Um, so yeah, there's like that thousand dollars for the uh, Airbnb, which we only use for one day, um, and the eight thousand dollars for the video guy. But of course, we're gonna get that back, right? The 300k is uh, right around the corner. Um, and the family is uh, kind of winding down. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not sharing any of these numbers with my wife, of course. Uh, I'm, uh, I volunteer to graciously do the family finances, uh, and everything's fine. So we get this video, amazing, right? Um, except we try to upload it, and uh, Kickstarter says, hey, wait a second, we don't support SaaS services. So everything that your, uh, your video talks about is uh, against our terms of service. Um, and our video is all like, hey, there's Indiegogo, but our entire video is like, hey, Kickstarter, hey, Kickstarter, hey, Kickstarter, help us out. Um, and of course, if we go back to the guy to go reshoot it, that's another five grand, which we don't have. So lesson, read the terms of service, um, which I still don't follow, by the way, so, um, and you can't go wrong with Keyboard Cat, of course. Um, all right, but, okay, that failed, uh, but we can still apply to YC. We hear all the cool kids are doing it, and they give you 100K now, you know? So um, they're not really investors. They're sort of, you know, people that, that can help, help us give a leg up, and that 100K can really, you know, all we need to do is fill out an application, and, like, they'll, uh, they'll love our demo, and, uh, you know, they'll give us 100K, and it's all good. But they don't like what we're doing. And they reject us pretty much right away. Here's Sad Sergi, and uh, working in the super depressing hacker dojo where we spent most of our days. Then, 
And we kind of think like, okay, so something's going wrong here. Like we've, we've tried all these things that we thought were gonna work. Uh, are we way off base here? Are we delusional? Uh, and of course the answer was, of course not. Like we are, I mean, this, is, this idea needs to exist and people just, just don't get it yet. You know, we, we're, we feel misunderstood. Um, so a slight lesson there is that blind optimism is aces for getting a business off the ground. Like it's, uh, you, you just need that to keep you afloat. By this time, uh, the family is like really, really running low on cash. Um, and you know, like the company has expenses too. We gotta pay for, for lunch and uh, l little things here and there. Um, and we found out at this point that we owed California franchise tax for two years in a row uh, because we you know, incorporated at just the wrong time, which we elected not to pay uh, for the time being and then paid penalties. So we just really need to hunker down. Like we need to save, save money, we really need to um, focus on, on building the product, maybe we can get something out there. Um, so we find this like burrito spot, this Mexican place, uh, that for one fajita plate, you can actually split it into two uh, portions because it comes with two fajitas um, and you make two burritos out of that so for nine bucks every day that's all we ate so it was just like no breakfast no lunch just that dinner because we got to make that uh, make those funds last and then out of the blue one of my daughters uh, here she is on Christmas Day um, that same night we find out that she has uh, to have emergency surgery because she has a hernia that's uh, uh, hereditary. Um, so she goes through all of these scans and tests and, uh, and all of these things cost close to 10 grand. And by the way, we um, neglected to get health insurance that wasn't, like, that when we, when we were starting, we got catastrophic health insurance because we were thinking, oh, we got like $45,000 in the bank. Like, of course we can cover um, a $10,000 deductible. So boom, there goes that uh, $10,000 straight out of our pockets. Thankfully, she, um, uh, about seven days later into the new year, uh, she had the surgery, she uh, recovered. Um, you know, here's two sisters really enjoying popsicles. That's one of the perks of uh, having surgery at that age. Um, but then what we find out is, okay, we don't have enough cash, so pull out the credit cards. Uh, and, you know, we're lucky enough to have enough credit to actually use credit cards, but... Um, there's that $10,000 um, deductible. And then we learn that the actual surgery, because it happened in the next year, it rolls over. So the deductible starts from scratch. And then we learn that there's a coinsurance past the deductible of 30% for this $100,000 surgery. So there's another $7,000. Um, and then, you know, other family expenses, and we're up to $30,000 in, um, in, in debt. And now, the family's worried, like Sergi's freaking out, I'm burning out, um, I'm calling my old boss to try to see if I can get my job back. Uh, Sergi is already uh, calling, like, thankfully his boss was somehow paying him like a, a monthly stipend just to keep him afloat, uh, but he's already talking about moving back to San Diego to go back to his job and see if we can like moonlight or um, you know, do something that, that doesn't feel like we're, we're about to, to die as a company. Um, we've sold a family car, so boom, uh, we had something that we uh, had some equity in and got something that was a lot cheaper and was a lease, so at least it's some, some cash in the bank. Uh, so that gave my wife a little bit of um, breathing room. But then goes another month and another $5,000 down. Um, and, and of course we start living just on credit cards. Like we just have a barely enough money in the bank to, um, to pay rent and keep like transferring these, keep doing these 2% uh, credit card transfers from uh, the credit card back to our bank account and then that sort of pays for our, uh, um, everything that, that we have to do to like support the family. So we decide, okay, we're gonna give this four more weeks. Like we're gonna do one last sprint and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Like we'll just go back to our jobs and um, and and maybe work on the side, and you know we'll we'll see what what comes after that. And that's what I committed to with uh, with my wife. Um, so then we really get down to to working from 7 a.m. to like 9:30 to 10 to 11 sometimes. It's basically work, 
sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep. Um, so we try to build this demo. That's not even a full product. Like you can't even uh, sign up and use it. Uh, but just an idea of uh, of what we want to build. By the way, this is like six, seven months after we started, which into what we thought was going to be a two month journey. Then thankfully. Uh, one of my coworkers at, uh, at Intuit, Bryant, joins us as a third co-founder. And with him brings a $10,000 check to bail out the company, essentially like fund operations for another few months. Um, so we got that uh, bit of breathing room, but that doesn't really help on the, on the family front. Um, but finally, with those, after those, that four uh, week sprint, we get something out, we post it on Hacker News, um, and it goes nuts. Like people um, upvoted, people start to talk about it on, on Twitter. Um, I mean, people, so many people visit our site that we had to turn off Mixpanel uh, because it just blew through their, through their limits. Um, and, and as you can tell, like at the, at the very end, the main, the main, or like the main thing I, I say is like, hey, can we get something different than those stupid fajitas? Um, and that was, the tiny bit of celebration that that um, that we were able to squeeze in on that on that crazy day. Then we get all this traffic. We start planning for like, how do we um, do we do we reapply to YC? Because we have to get some sort of investment. Because none of this came with money. It was just traffic. Um, but there was nothing uh, for for people to pay uh, for. It wasn't an actual product yet. It was just an idea or a demo of what the product was going to be. Uh, so we start practicing. Um, uh, we got like a speech coach to to like interview, do some interview training, um, and we go, uh, we did get an interview at YC, and we're so nervous that we go into uh, a movie, it was actually the Tom Cruise movie, Oblivion, of all, uh, of all movies, um, and we're just waiting for this call to find out if our interview went well. Um, and the way that it works is, if you're in, they give you a phone call, if you're out, they send you an email. So halfway through the movie, I, my phone buzzes, and of course I'm over the moon, so I hop out of the movie theater, and uh, it's, it's somebody from YC saying, hey, we want to invest, um, you're in, here are the terms, like, do you accept them? And of course, I'm like, yes, this is amazing. And I'm just like literally sat down and almost started crying. And Sergi and Bryant jumped out of the movie theater, like they knew something was happening. They, they saw how excited I was. Um, and we don't have a picture together, so I just pulled this <laughs> stock photo of three random, random people high-fiving. That was um, close approximation. So then we go back into uh, into watching the movie, um, and we're like super getting like it's uh, we call our families and and set up a dinner an hour from then like because my brother's girlfriend in San Francisco, uh, Brian's girlfriend is uh, down south in Saratoga, so we arrange this dinner and go back to watch the movie. And as I'm watching the movie, my phone buzzes, and I get this email uh, from YC that says, "Hey, unfortunately." Uh, we decided not to fund you at this time for the for the exact same reason why uh, I would have rejected us, which is like you're you're too hard for you know novice users and for professional users it's not powerful enough. And they say you know this is just not um, not the kind of revenue business uh, that is investable. Um, and we are just like I mean imagine this roller coaster we're just over the moon for for getting this uh, the idea of this funding and then getting rejected just uh, 45 minutes later. Uh, so we call them and call them and the, um, respond to the email, no response. So we just decide, all right, we're just going to go drive to their office, find out where it is, and figure out what the hell's going on. And while we're driving there, the same person who sent this email calls and says, I'm so sorry, it was done by mistake. And we, we still don't know if that was the mistake <laughs> or it was the, uh, the really, really... Um, I don't know what the word is, uh, sad email I sent her a response, as a response that said, hey, my entire family is like going in to celebrate at this dinner, and I already told them that we're funded and we're broke. <laughs> um, so I don't know if it was like the sob story, or we actually got in and it was an honest mistake, uh, but we got in. Um, so yay. Um, so we go through the program, and they inject um, $100,000 into the company. Whew, I mean, that's a huge relief. Immediately. Um, we pay back like the money that I put in, so that's uh, great for our family. We pay off some uh, some credit card bills, 
Um, and then over several years, it sort of like took a while to pay off all the, all the bills, uh, et cetera. There's some other medical stuff. But now the company has some cash, you know, like we can, we can actually operate and, and start pay, paying ourselves like a tiny bit of salary to, to at least not get behind uh, that much. So we're thinking, okay, we, we're in YC, we're gonna go like pitch to investors and they're gonna love us. Uh, we'll raise like a, a bunch of millions of dollars like everybody else is. And of course, it's only gonna take two weeks. Um, but the story was not that. Uh, we finished YC, we did demo day, nobody wanted to invest, it was the same story. Like, people are too confused by the product. Um, and it took us six months to raise anything. And we sort of got into the same mentality as um, we didn't even question, like this was the only avenue that we had to, to fund operations for the company. Uh, so we saw that as the only way to, to pay our salaries. We, we went to the bank and they were like, software, what is this stuff? Like, we, we wanna see actual revenues. And we didn't have that, so, that, so then we raised uh, another 200k, and it was like kind of slow going. Um, then another 50, and then and then when we sort of decided uh, for three months we were having trouble raising more, we just said no, we're not raising anymore. And once we told investors, they just poured in for some reason. Uh, so the takeaway there is like very few people are willing to lead, and and the thing that makes investors want to invest is when you don't need their money. Um, that is. Uh, if you can manufacture that and you're looking for investors, just pretend you don't need it. Um, uh, so for us, it was like, all right, now it's go time again. We got a bunch of money. We have like almost $3 million in the bank. Um, but it's not a business, it's a startup now, right? So we gotta like get an office, we gotta buy Ikea stuff, we gotta build uh, all this furniture, we need a game room of course, because you know, hashtag culture. Uh, we need to have meetings, um, we need to like interview serious candidates, put our game faces on, we need a ping pong table, uh, we need like interns to play uh, <laughs> ping pong. Um, we gotta do like retreats and we, you know, uh, we need to look at important people doing talks uh, and learn from them. Uh, that's the Google guys. You need know, like Christmas parties and more retreats and uh, we need to go over to Sandwich Video because all the startups are doing uh, videos with them and pay them 100K to do our video. Um, we need to like launch some stuff and those are my parents. That has nothing to do with the storyline but they're cool. Um, <laughs> Um, then we need more retreats and Christmas parties and we need to sponsor a bunch of events um, and we need a brand new office. Uh, we need to make cakes for everything that we, that, that we release. But guess what? All of this just trickled down our bank balance. Um, and this happened over the course of a year and a half. And then we dipped and the, and the speed was so fast um, that we just, we just didn't even notice it. Um, and then we had to make a decision. Uh, we were at a dinner once and um, around that time and I got, this, uh, I got this fortune and I was thinking like there is no, <laughs> there's no profitability here. We're not, like we're about to run out of cash and we're gonna have to go back to investors. And we actually started having some conversations but we had no traction to raise more. Uh, it was going to be at like really bad terms. So we had an inflection point. Um, I should probably name a conference after that. Um, <laughs> And we decided then that cash is king. Like um, really the, the, what the company needs to be is default alive. What that means is if we never raise money again, we're gonna survive. Uh, so that means we have to fund that with revenue. Um, and if we do that, we can control our own destiny. We don't have to go back to investors um, to, to get more cash. So then we started like really focusing on the business. We cut expenses. Uh, we didn't have to lay anybody off, but we were really focused on, on not spending money um, and slowly started building that back up over the next two years. And since then, we've had what we like to call uh, 1,800 rounds of uh, funding, and these happen uh, just about every day, uh, where Stripe transfers over um, what our customers uh, pay us for, for the product um, that they use, that they find valuable. Um, and that's the best source of non-dilutive capital. Um, but I think the thing that's important, even with investors, even though we've done uh, over $40 million in revenue since then, nowhere near the quilt, uh, Story, but we'll catch it. Uh, we've had over 80,000 paying customers. Um, and the great thing is we have happy investors because they uh, see the value in building a real business. Like we found the right investors uh, that don't pressure us into um, avenues that, that we're not comfortable with. And the thing that's important there is 
venture capital, just like revenue and just like profits, it's just a tool. Like you can wield that tool uh, to your advantage if you know how to use it well. It doesn't have to take over um, everything that you believe in, doesn't have to take over your values, doesn't have to take over your business. You can use that as a, as a tool to grow your business faster. And in our case, to even have a business at all. I think we would have been completely dead had we uh, not had um, investors step in. Uh, so just s some things to leave you with, um, like really define your values, like what you believe in and what you want to um, encourage in your company and what you want to see in your community and your, uh, among your customer base and your product. Um, and true partners, whether they're like customers or employees or even investors, they will amplify those if you stand up for them. If you speak up for what you believe in and you uh, don't budge on them, uh, People who are true partners will actually amplify them and, and help you out um, with spreading those values to the world. And that allows you to build on your own terms, even though you have partners on board uh, that are uh, providing capital or providing advice, et cetera. And right now, um, at the end of the day, even though this, this conference is about profit-driven companies, uh, where we ended up was somewhere in the middle, where we are actually an impact-driven company, where every single bit of profit that we have, uh, we, we try to drive profit down to zero, where we're trying to invest into uh, how do we get the product to be better? How do we hire more people to provide more value to our customers faster, uh, rather than putting that profit into our own pockets to you know, live a better lifestyle or whatever? That'll come, but for us right now, what's more, most important is for our customers to have a better lifestyle because of our product. That's all, thank you so much. Frank, do we have time for questions or? That YC rejection email that you got, that user dead zone that they talked about, that's, that's the same user that you guys cater to today. It's like all of us in here. How do you feel now, today, about sort of how YC viewed you and were they wrong? Uh, it's actually still hard to tell. So this, this is a story that technology um, has repeated many times. So when spreadsheets first came out, for example, uh, most industry experts, most programmers said like, hey, this isn't powerful enough. It's not going to replace Fortran, COBOL, et cetera. Uh, and you couldn't actually prove with VisiCalc or the f early versions of Excel that it could actually do that. And it was only over the decades um, that it became such a prevalent and powerful tool. Uh, so they, I don't think they were wrong. Um, I think a lot of people would, would have made that call. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of like uh, progressing technology and, and making it do more and more that, that proves that um, uh, over time, they, if, if somebody were to make that call now, they probably would be wrong, just because there's a lot more proof points that it's possible. Yeah, so um, thank you. My question has to do with, um, since you raised uh, the venture capital from the investors, they typically have a fun life five to eight years where they want to return their money to their LPs. What type of pressure has that put on you from the investors to you know, get liquidity for them? Uh, and have you considered like a, like a, a not a management buyout, but a, yeah. I guess an investor buyout? Uh, we've, so we've been around for more than seven years now. We've gotten zero pressure. Uh, it all depends on the investor. Um, investors can always recycle their funds into a different different fund, um, and and good investors will always align um, their their interests with um, the what's what's globally globally maximized for that company's impact. So if the company can actually generate 10 times more revenue over the course of like 30 years, a good investor will actually be patient enough to wait for that uh, versus trying to, trying to force a, uh, an early exit or something like that. So we've thankfully seen zero of that. And in fact, there's, there's something called the Friedman doc Doctrine. I don't know if uh, many of you heard of it, but it's like the idea that uh, the main directive of any business is to um, maximize shareholder value. And then everything else gets solved by that. Um, you know, social problems, societal problems, um, like environmental problems, employee problems, uh, customer problems, et cetera. And I fundamentally don't believe that. Like that's a, you know, that's something that, that solves for primarily rich people. Uh, and a lot of investors are now like of the same mindset, honestly. Like they see that when you align the, the interests and well-being of not just shareholders, uh, but customers and employees and team members and uh, entire communities, uh, then over the long term, you build a lot more value. And, and that translates to dollars and to returns. 
Sorry. It's no you. worries. Um, first, I want to thank you. Your speech was very candid, and thank you me. shared some um, very valuable insights. It's not often people are that transparent. That really resonated. Um, you. Can you talk a little bit more about the investor component? So you are working with investors, and you're talking about good investors. What should we be screening for? How do you think about an investor before you even walk into the room? What are the questions that we should be asking? How do we, how do you screen? Yeah, uh, I think the, the number one question I ask myself is, does this person believe in me? Um, me as a person and my values and, and what I want to create. Uh, and that's when you really separate the, the proverbial wheat from the chaff. Like you can tell when somebody's really invested in your success versus uh, how do I get my money out? Um, so I think that's, you just feel it in your gut. Like you know, like our board meetings are basically what I'll describe, like, you know, walking around with a coffee and saying, hey, things feel good? All right, are you taking a vacation? Great. Um, how, are, how are people feeling? All right, and, and I think that's a, um, there are a lot more good investors like that now. So when you, when you have any apprehensions after meeting somebody like socially, culturally, um, before you even get to like the business or um, anything around like what you're building, uh, that's the thing that's really important. Like do you feel like this person is fully invested in who you are uh, and what you believe in and are they gonna help amplify that and be a true partner versus like a boss or something like that? So I'll just repeat that. It sounds like when you switch to a profitable business, it's like a mindset, like, oh, we could, should just be profitable, so let's do it. But presumably every you know, venture-funded business would do that. What are the trade-offs that you've seen from just switching? Is there, for example, you sacrifice growth? Are there other costs that you see? Um, in our case, we were only able to do that at a specific time where we were making enough revenue. Um, I don't think we would have been, been able to do it sooner because we just didn't have the product uh, to be able to sell enough of it uh, to to pay for for the people needed to even build the product to that to that place. So it's it's not always an option. Um, but in our case, it was you know like being really methodical about cutting expenses and and not hiring uh, new folks until we were able to see sort of that uh, inflection of like cash burning start to turn around into a uh, a pattern where it was starting to like go in the other direction. Last question over here. Yeah, so kind of to piggyback on, on, on this question, similar question in terms of how do, you, how do you start selling a product that's not good enough for customers and how do you kind of build that momentum that somebody should be paying you? So um, we actually, I think the only reason we survived was early on Webflow was good enough for a very tiny percentage of customers. Um, so we had, you know, that first early key 100 people who, you know, for them it was fundamentally empowering. Like they no longer had to hire a developer. They only had to build like very simple landing pages. It wasn't like a complicated marketing site. And they were willing to pay for that because you know, they were paying us 20 bucks and they were getting $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 $3, from a client. Where other, like before Webflow, they were giving, you know, $2,500 to a developer to translate their Photoshop mock to, to code or something like that. So I think it's absolutely critical for some sort of even tiny product market fit um, to uh, create something profitable. Like people must want quilts uh, for you to like, create quilts uh, and sell them. Um, like there has to be demand for, for what you're creating. There's, there's really no way to jam uh, a product down somebody's <coughs> throat. I wish there was a easier way to do that. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone.